So we're looking at time of the end alliances, left-right politics, and prophecy. With that title, let's definitely start with a word of prayer. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that your word has never missed in 2,500 years of this prophecy unfolding. And Lord, I ask for your wisdom both in my presentation and in how people hear this. In Jesus' name, I ask it. Amen. So, uh, oops, I'm going to skip right through that one, folks. That's where I want to get to. No political party saves you. Only Jesus saves you. You can agree to that, can't you? Good. No politician saves you. Only Jesus saves you. No church or culture saves you. Only Jesus saves you. Your Seventh-day Adventist. Did the Seventh-day Adventist church ever die for your sins? No. Only Jesus saves us, right? And from our last presentation, you found out that not only does Jerusalem and God's people get caught in the middle, but Jesus got caught in the middle too. And so if you're following Jesus and you're part of his people, don't be surprised if you get caught in the middle. I was once pastoring a fairly good-sized church. It had 900 and some members. And we had one rich guy that leaned hard right and a rich guy that leaned pretty hard left. And they both wanted to control the church. And I knew when I, before I came what the story was, and I told conference leadership that invited me to take over. I said, are you sure you want me to do this job? Because they're probably both going to get mad and leave. Because I won't play their games. They brought me in anyway. <laughs> and I remember being in the one guy's office one day. He said, you're in the hip pocket of so-and-so. I started laughing. I said, basically, that's about what he told me yesterday, but I was in your hip pocket yesterday. I said, you guys need to know something. As long as he's pushing on me from that side and you're pushing me on this side, you're going to hold me up. I can't fall down because you're both holding me up from opposite sides. <laughs> there are some advantages, so to speak, in being caught in the middle. <laughs> uh, they both left the church. <laughs> And it was a little better after that. Uh, a little less conflict. And notice I said less conflict. It was a very conflicted church. But anyway, so know this. I'm an equal opportunity offender. If you lean hard left or hard right, I will probably be offending you. All right? But hang on. Don't get mad and walk out because wait long enough, I'll get the other side too. All right? Also... Ever heard conservatives talk about the bleeding heart liberals and the liberals about those hard-headed conservatives? So which do you need, logic or feeling? You need both of them. Guess what? If you have both of them, you're likely to get caught in the <laughs> middle. There's a lot of bad news in the world, right? But it's really pointing forward to good news. So when I look at all the bad news, I'm not that worried because I know Jesus is coming again. And one other piece that I want to put out here, which group of people did Jesus give you permission to hate? No one. None of them, right? So if you're in a hard right-leaning group, are they teaching you to love the hard left? No. If you're in a hard left group, are they teaching you to love the hard right? Hmm, maybe they both have a problem then. So you get an idea of how I'm going to be doing this, right? I will be an equal opportunity offender. And people say, why do I do that? Because it's the only way I've figured out that I can talk to this without getting people furious with me. As long as I hit both sides, I can survive. I learned that the hard way. <laughs> so we're going to look at who the time of the end allies are during this third and final conflict. During the first and second conflict, there were allies for Islam. There were allies for the Christian world, but they weren't in prophecy. But you can look through history and read them. The interesting thing is the time of the end, the allies are actually in prophecy. 
Daniel tells you the overview of it, and then D Revelation gives you the allies. And that's what we're going to look at. Now, let's see this part right off. We've seen this before, but this is what we're looking at. This is our time right now. These are the verses we are living in. At the time of the end, the king of the south, Islam and their allies, shall attack him. Well, we had a king of the south for the first time in 2014, and since then, it's gotten really interesting. For the first time since the Ottoman Empire, I should say. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. And the king of the north, the pope, calls for military uh, force against the radical Muslims, and the United States applies it. The king of the north and their allies shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. He shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. He shall also enter the glorious land. So the king of the north forces will enter Israel. And many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. We've already talked about how radical Islam is, you know, they're all out against the West and Israel. Moderate Muslims, Abrahamic Accords, they're working with the West and Israel. And how some, Edom, Moab, and Ammon, escape. That would be those who are following Jesus in the Bible, ultimately. But Edom, Moab, and Ammon is also Western Jordan, which has followed a very interesting tightrope tight walk. It's a Muslim country, but it's been friendly to Israel and others much of the time. So here's what we have. If you want to know who the allies are, you go to Revelation. And in Revelation 11, this is confusing, by the way, Daniel 11 and Revelation 11, and once in a while, my tongue will slip and say Revelation 11 when I meant Daniel 11 or vice versa. Okay? But it, easily to remember, it's both chapter 11. And Revelation 13 is the king of the north allies or alliance. And so that's what we're going to look at. Revelation 11 comes first. So we start with that first. Now, there is something that caused a lot of confusion for historicist Bible prophecy students. They made an assumption. <laughs> Assumptions can be dangerous. They made an assumption that when Daniel says Egypt and Revelation says Egypt, it's one and the same. That's not a good assumption. Let me show you why. When Daniel says Babylon and Revelation, John says Babylon, are they talking about the same thing? No. When John, uh, Daniel says Babylon, he means the nation of Babylon. When John says Babylon, is he talking about a rock? No. One is, the other is like the model, right? So we got in trouble when historicist Bible prophecy students said, oh, they're the same when we get to Egypt. No. When Daniel says Egypt, it is Egypt. When John says Egypt, it's like Egypt. You can read the entire book of Daniel, and the only place that his place names are questionable is in Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Everywhere else in the entire book, whenever he uses a place name, he means that place. So where's the burden of proof? On those who say it's literal, just like it's always been, or on those that say, no, this is symbolic. It's on the symbolic folks, folks, because they're changing the rules partway through. And they have nothing in the text to indicate it. Which has led to trouble. Which is why we can't, haven't understood it until we get into the middle of it. But that's what God said was going to happen, so he's using all things for good like usual. So
so interestingly, let's take a look, and this fits perfectly all the other place name usage that Egypt is the land of Egypt and the people of Egypt in Daniel. It is like it in Revelation. We're going to read through this briefly. Verses 3 through 14 of Revelation 11. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the people's Tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into the graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now, after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Now, how many woes are there in Revelation? Three. Three. How many conflicts were there between the north and the south? After the time of Jesus in Daniel? Three. We're talking about the same things here. And so this is the introduction to the third woe, the third conflict, but now in Revelation. Let's unpack it. Con time context. Because unless you're really in the Bible prophecy, Revelation 11 was just a, what did that all say? <laughs> all right. So we're going to unpack it for you. Number one, time context. It is somewhere around the end of the 1260 days. Those day for a year, 538, 1798, the time of papal supremacy and power. It shows up in multiple places in Daniel and Revelation. So it, it's got a lot of backing to it. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Well, from 1100 through the 1930s, most Bible prophecy people believe that these woes were Islam and Christianity in conflict. And then it became politically incorrect to say it, so it disappeared after the 30s and 1940s. It was just kind of interesting. If you doubt that, you can take a look in the back of our book, and there is a list of Bible commenta commentaries, over 100 of them, that saw Islam in the first, in the woes. All right? Some of them were early on, before the second and third woe, but they'd already seen it as what's going on in the woes. And you'd recognize many of the names of major... Protestant leaders, etc., that were in there. So it, the time context should be around 1798, but before 1840, which was when the Ottoman Empire became a protectorate of the European empires, and a time prophecy on the second woe pointed to that date in 1840. So now back to the sim symbolic or literal part. Notice when it talked about Egypt. And their two dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually, notice it's spiritually here. You do know that Revelation uses some symbolism, right? 
Do you know there's only one place where he says he's using it symbolically or spiritually? This one. Why this one? This is where the scholars said Daniel's literal isn't literal because uh, they wanted to match Revelation exactly. And by doing this, John is saying this is not a complete match to Daniel's Egypt. This is spiritually called. It's not really. It's like it. And the place where we were given the safeguards where we ignored it. And that's kind of typical. Oh, there are two witnesses. They're, two, they're dead bodies, the two witnesses. I believe that to be the Old and New Testaments. God's two witnesses through time. At God's word, uh, there were plagues, there's fires, there's droughts, there's all these kind of things, aren't there, through the scripture. And so God has these two witnesses that for 1,260 years, they were clothed in sackcloth. You could get to them if you were a scholar. They were available in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Chained down the in the monastery so you couldn't leave with them. But you could get to them if you were privileged. They were clothed in sackcloth. They weren't really available. However, there's going to be a short time, three and a half days, three and a half years, where they're going to try and kill them. And, but notice where this is going to be. In a place spiritually called Sodom, Egypt, where also our Lord is crucified. Like Sodom, like Egypt, like Jerusalem. And you have the French Revolution. It fits around 1798, but before 1840. Time context fits perfectly. What about the symbolic location? Is it sort of like Sodom? Throughout marriage and morals for a while. And it is still the foundation of throwing out morality today. Um, is it like Egypt? Pharaoh said, I don't know God. French Revolution, there's no God but France and reason. There's the only things you're allowed to worship. By the way, when you worship your reason, you become most unreasonable. And finally, like Jerusalem, a place that had God's word for centuries, but when it came right down to the test, they went contrary to it. It all matches the time and the place, the description of it. And so there would lay in the street for three and a half days, three and a half years, and people would be rejoicing. They actually burned Bibles, carried them through the streets, their ashes, or their burned, you know, charred remains, and celebrated the death of scriptures and the death of the wretch, Jesus. So why are they celebrating? They don't want to be bound by God's word. They want to do what they want to do. Don't question us. Just let us ha have it our way. Sound familiar? This is back from the time of the French Revolution. As I read this, think about today's world. Anyone denounced for seeking to inspire discouragement, spreading false news, corrupting the public conscience of impair and impairing the purity and energy of the revolutionary government could be brought before the Revolutionary Tribunal. No witnesses would be allowed to be called, nor could the accused have a defense counsel. And... Uh, Sounds like our world today. False news? Do you have any false news in today's world? Some people say fake news. Uh, do you, you do realize that you de need to know who you're listening to? Because one set of media will tilt it one way and another set of media will tilt it another way. Almost everything we hear is not really honest news it's okay once you learn that so that you get an idea of which sources they go to to get the other side of the story as well all right but ever heard of cancel culture back in the french revolution it was a guillotine a hard cancel culture 
Today, it's a soft cancel culture. They'll just try and take away your social media life and your job and everything else if you don't play by the rules. We call it cancel culture. Doesn't kill people necessarily, but a lot of people committed suicide as a result of it. It's not a good thing. After three and a half days, they would be revived. Well, you got a revival that kicks in. Right at the end of the French Revolution, there is a massive revival, and it be, is the rise of mission and Bible societies. They said they were going to get rid of Scripture. Instead, within just a few short years, the Bible is going to the world like never before. God must laugh when human beings say what they're going to do to him and his movement. So here's the French Revolution, that little blip right there. And here's the rise of the mission and Bible societies. I want you to notice something. French Revolution is going off right here. And then the papacy is going down. By the way, the French took the papacy down. They were not a friend of the king of the north. The French Revolution was an enemy of the king of the north. Can you see where the alliance might be coming from? in our world today. And so the papacy goes down and Islam goes down and this rise of mission and Bible societies right in here, the golden age of missions and all that and Bible societies and the rise of our own church, the Seventh-day Adventist church in that time period. God created a whole without major opposition for the gospel to spread to the world to get a foundational stand. It's kind of interesting when you see that on a graph and you can see what happened. <clears throat> Wikipedia. The French Revolution had a great and far-reaching impact that probably transformed the world more than any other revolution. Its repercussions include lessening the importance of religion, rise of modern nationalism, spread of liberalism, and igniting the age of revolutions. So when it says there's an earthquake afterwards, it's a political earthquake because revelation is symbolic. And the whole world is shaken politically from the French Revolution. In the book Great Controversy, 1888, closer to the French Revolution than now. <clears throat> Pastor, can you get me some water? Absolutely. Think about our world again as I read this description. Eager re to redress the wrongs they had suffered, are people that are protesting upset about wrongs they've suffered? Left or right? They determined to undertake a reconstruction of society, an outraged populace whose minds were filled with bitter and long treasured memories of wrong, resolved to revolutionize the state of misery that had grown unbearable. So, what if Black Lives Matter and Proud Boys show up at the same place? They're both filled with anger about the perceived wrongs. It can get pretty brutal, can't it? And to avenge themselves upon those whom they regard as the authors of their suffering. The war against the Bible inaugurated an era which stands in the world's history as the reign of terror. Peace and happiness were banished from the homes and hearts of men. No one was secure. He who triumphed today was suspected condemned tomorrow. Remember when Elon Musk was a darling of the political left? And not so much anymore. Violence and lust held on disputed sway. Kings, clergy, and nobles were compelled to submit to the atrocities of an excited and maddened people. A general slaughter of all suspected of hostility to the revolution was determined. The cities of the kingdom were filled with scenes of horror. One party of revolutionists was against another party, and France became a field for contending masses swayed by the fury of their passions. And to add to the general misery, the nation became involved in a prolonged and devastating war. The country was nearly bankrupt. Does it sound familiar? All of these things are happening in our world right now. And civilization was almost in extinguished in anarchy and license. How civilized does it feel 
when you're in downtown Portland, Seattle, or San Francisco? Not very. All these things are happening. We are looking at a replay of the same stuff. Well, let's take a look at what happens from the French Revolution. We have the French Revolution and its ideas lay dormant for a little bit. Not long. <laughs> because by the time we hit the 1840s, now remember it says it's starting before the close of the second woe, but at the close of the second woe it's going to come out. And that's exactly what happens. You have Charles Darwin. You don't need God. We evolved. Karl Marx. We don't need God throughout the opiate of the people. We're going to replace it with Marxist socialism. And those ideas take off. You have uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, China, and many other countries go Marxist socialist or communist. And are communist countries friends of the Bible? No. Not at all. Okay. But then, right about 1990, the Soviet Union collapses, and with it, Marxist social, socialism in the Eastern European countries. And it looked like they were coming down. Hmm. Did they stay down? No. They have resurged, especially since 2020. Now, let's go back and notice something else. The French Revolution and the political left are tied to Islam in Revelation 11. Daniel talks about Egypt, Libya, Ethiopia, and Jordan. They are all Islamic context. If you go to those countries today, you're going to be looking at a lot of Islamic influence, aren't you? It's just a reality. But Revelation 11.8, it's spiritually called, but in other words, it's linking this power out of the French Revolution with Egypt. Pharaoh said, I don't know God. France said, we don't know God. The second woe was passed. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. The woes were Islamic. This power is tied to the second and goes into the third woe. It's rising at the end of the second woe, moves into the third. Well, that matches the three conflicts of Daniel and the three, three woes of Revelation and the three conflicts of Daniel. Now, if we're right on this, Egypt and many countries, radical Islam go down, moderate, Libya and Ethiopia follow the king of the north, and a remnant escapes by following Jesus in the Bible. Three-way split in Daniel 11. Well, if radical left, or the left is a parallel, the radicals are going to go down, the moderates are going to follow papal-led Christianity, and some will follow Jesus in the Bible. And that is exactly what we're watching all over. Uh, and you might say, well, Tim, did you come to these conclusions after or before all this stuff happened? King of the North Alliance, I've always had that one. King of the South Alliance, I've been working on. But I will tell you, I put it in the print before it was really obvious. Uh, I was rewriting my books in 2020. And I put it in there. And uh, in March of this year, in a Daniel 11 conference in Berrien Springs, Michigan, I presented what's called what was called a unity viewpoint on how they're not, is it one or the other, it's really both as time of the end alliance. And that might actually be bringing harmony, the Daniel 11 studies now, beginning to do that. So that was all before it became exceedingly obvious in October. It was just laying out from scripture where this was going to go. Now, Marxist socialism took a hit, dropped, but once we hit uh, these end-time events, 
they become resurging back in in harmony with radical Islam. And they've come out in the open on it. And so really what I'm pointing out is the political right leans towards the papacy and the political left leans towards Islam. Now I'm going to get around to going after the right in a little bit. But I'm going to talk a little bit more about the left simply because they're the ones in power right now and it's easy to track and show you what's going on. The right will come into power and will end up being even worse than the left is right now. So if you're leaning left, just realize, yeah, I'm hitting the left hard right now, but I think the right's going to end up even worse. So let's take a look at it. Similarities in cooperation between the radical left and radical Islam. They both dislike Israel. They hate Israel. Uh, back in May of 2021, there was an 11-day sh missile shooting match between Hamas and Israel. Centrist Democrats supported Israel and leftist Democrats supported Palestinians. Ha, huh, but what was really interesting, Abrahamic Accords were already being signed by then. And the radical Muslims sided with Hamas and the moderate Muslims sided with Israel. Just amazing to watch. This is the thing that the Bible is saying three-way split and it's happening. And it's happening not only in Islam, it's happening in the parallel, the ally out of Revelation 11 as well. The same split. And Biden's having a problem in his own White House because the split is ripping his White House apart. They both hate capitalism. The Atlantic Monthly. Thousands of Americans have become socialists since March. During COVID, socialism and Marxism were on the rampage. They were growing radically in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, both Islam and the left, radical left and radical Islam, hate papal-led Christianity. Crisis Magazine, who are they being attacked by? They lay it out. Muslim and the far left. Moderate Muslims and moderate left both like the papacy. The radicals hate it. Both the radical left and radical Islam hate American exceptionalism. One says death to America, the other says down with America during their street protest. Look at this interesting one. U.S. Southern Command Chief says Iran's Quds Force is sending weapons and troops to Venezuela. Remember, Quds Force is the Jerusalem Force. Oh, why would a religious dictatorship be sending weapons and support to a atheistic dictatorship. Marxist socialist one. They have the same common enemy. They both hate America. In the Middle East, there is a saying that explains a lot of things. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And they have the same enemy. Radical left and radical Islam, they hate Israel and the United States. Israel's the little Satan. The United States is the big Satan. They both hate conservative politicians. That could be obvious. But what was really interesting to me was when Soleimani was killed. The radical left and radical Islam all over the world were furious. Moderate left, moderate Islam, they were quietly happy about it because he created so much trouble. Both the radical left and radical Islam love or like social justice. Now here's where I can get in trouble. With an exception, LGBTQ. What do radical Muslims do to homosexuals? They kill them. But have you seen since October 7, LGBTQ groups out demonstrating in favor of Hamas? 
If they were to go to Gaza and do that, they would be killed by Palestinians. Where did people's critical thinking go? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. School official prevents students from attending book club event with author who survived ISIS sex slavery over concerns it would foster Islamophobia. In the areas where radical Islam is controlled, yes, you can go to a slave market and buy sex slaves. But that was not allowed to be told in Canada by the school boards because somebody might not like radical Islam after that. Hmm. That's interesting. Meanwhile, during 2021, there were 50 Canadian churches that were vandalized and burned, or burned to the ground. What would have happened to the news media if 50 mosques would have been attacked during that time period in 2021? That would have been a huge story, wouldn't it? But do you know what the Canadian news system was saying? They were cheering on the attacks on the churches. Why? Because, say, 100 years ago or more, there were schools for Indian children, First Nation. And the First Nation students didn't always get a choice if they wanted to be there. And there were some really hard times. And a lot of those students died. Actually, many of the staff died as well. It, they were hard times. But the media was stirring all that up, getting people angry, and then they were attacking and burning churches, and the media was saying, the churches have it coming. Hmm. But you can't talk about Islamic State sex slavery that's going on right now. You can talk about what happened 100 years ago, but you can't talk about what's going on now. It was just interesting to watch, which lets you know that a lot of the media leans left, especially in Canada. Domestic terrorist group Jane's Revenge threatens escalated violence against pro-life ministries. From here forward, any anti-choice group who closes their doors and stops operating will no longer be a target. But until you do, it's open season and we know where your operations are. The infrastructure of the enslavers will not survive. We will never stop, back down, slow down, or retreat. Jane's Revenge declared, through attacking, we find joy, courage, and strip the veneer of impenetrability held by these violent institutions. So let's see. If you're pro-life and you're helping save children, you're a violent institution. But you're a good group if you're firebombing and attacking those places. And for many months, the Department of Justice wouldn't press charges on anybody, even though they had video. It's starting to happen. The impending Thermidor reaction in Jacob in America. Any idea what that means based on the title? In the French Revolution, when the pendulum swung, they called it the Thermidor reaction. The French Revolution swung it way hard to the left, and then it swings hard the other way. They're just going back to the French Revolution to describe what's happening in our world right now. And it is an accurate parallel. You may have been familiar with the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. The Los Angeles Dodgers will honor the drag group Mocking Catholics, Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. The Dodgers will give the group a Community Hero Award. So the Dodgers say, hey, we're going to give this award to the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Um, <laughs> There's an outcry, and they say, no, we're not. There's an outcry now from the left. Okay, yes, we will. And so they ended up giving the award, even though the parking lot of the stadium was full of people protesting from the other side. 
no matter what side they went to after this, they were in trouble. But once you take a stand with either side, yeah, you're going to take the flack for it. My hope is that you're going to love people on both sides. Amen. All right? You, that you'll pay a price for too. But when they're flip-flopping from the king of the north to the king of the south, king of the north, king of the south again, I just had to smile and watch their misery as they tried to figure out which one they were going to go with. Don't go with either the north or the south, the left or the right. All right? Destroy the role of parents. Corinne Jean-Pierre gets angry reaction for saying children belong to all of us. White House Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre has drawn angry reactions for commenting that children belong to all of us at an award ceremony held by the Gay and Lesbian Alliance against defamation. Jean-Pierre made the comments during an interview with Jezebel Magazine at the 2003 GLAAD Awards weeks after President Joe Biden said, now I just want to stop for a bit. French Revolution, it is like Sodom, it's without morals. Where's this stuff happening? Jezebel Magazine, stuff like that. I mean, can it not be clear what's involved here? Society throwing out morals. Uh, he goes on, what Biden said, there's no such thing as someone else's child. Our nation's children are all of our children. She was advocating for children to have increased access to sex change operations, procedures which are banned or restricted in many countries. Now, here's an interesting thing. Actual research tells us that when somebody goes through gender-changing surgeries, their risk of suicide goes up, not down. It's opposite of the claims. Um, there are laws in 22 states in the United States, at least in September there were. There might be more than 22 states now. Get this. If you're a counselor and somebody comes up to you in the LGBTQ community and says to you that we want help, can you help us leave this lifestyle? If you try to help them leave the LGBTQ lifestyle in 22 states, you are breaking the law, even when they're requesting it. So if somebody is in the LGBTQ and they want to come out of that, it's illegal. But if somebody is not in it and you coach them into going into it, that is legal. It's legal only one direction. That should tell you something. That's the world that we live in. And for pastors and counselors, I believe it's time to stand up and say, no, we will not cooperate with your laws. Take a play from the playbook of Martin Luther King Jr. What did he do to take down racism? Did he get an army and weapons and fight? Mm -mm. They just did the right things and took the beatings for it. And when you saw large numbers of blacks with some whites being beaten, for doing the right thing, what did it do to the population's understanding of who the beaters were? The pictures destroyed the old system. We need to take a play for Martin Luther King Jr. and be willing to take the heat for quietly doing the right thing when you get caught in the middle. Look at this one. It's not a very old one. Why Western women are converting to Islam. Since October 7, young Americans have been professing their devotion to the Quran in the ultimate rebellion against the West. Young left-leaning feminists are becoming Muslims in huge numbers. Since October 7. They're becoming Muslim because they're agreeing with Hamas. Really? If you become a Muslim woman, what does the Quran give your husband the 
right to do if he disagrees, if you disagree with him? Kill you. Beat you or kill you. Really? Where does critical thinking go in all this? This isn't working very well. Now I'm going, I've been accused of triggering on Facebook, I mean TikTok already. I've been on TikTok for a couple of days. Uh, <laughs> TikTok is awful, folks. I, I don't actually go on it. I've hired some people to put my short videos up there for me. Uh, but they're just taking little editing my videos in the 50 some second videos and posting them. You ought to see the responses. They're vulgar, they're horrendous, they're racist, and they accuse me of being triggering when I'm saying we should love everybody. Do we live in an upside down world or what? It's, it's liberal theology. Yeah. But, okay, my next slide is probably triggering. All right, just a little heads up, okay? Where's our critical thinking? Feminists for wife beaters and killers. LGBTQ for LGBTQ plus killers. Black Lives Matters for slaveholders. And yes, they still hold slaves, the radical Muslims. Or Jews for Jew killers. All of those groups right now in the left are siding with Hamas and radical Islam. Every one of those groups is in trouble if they take over. It's not logical, but neither is the right logical. The right claims it's following God's word, but it's not. Huh. Watch this. Back in the 70s, there was a saying put out by the radical left. The issue is never the issue. The issue is always the revolution. Watch this. The left was pro-feminist. Hey, should we have equal pay for equal jobs, etc.? Duh. Yeah, we should. But the old traditional Christianity wasn't always following the principles of Scripture, was it? They said they were, but they weren't. So they're not that good at their critical thinking either. But... What happened to their value of women when LGBT, especially T, comes along? If you're in women's sports, have you been helped or hurt by LGBTQ? You've been hurt badly. In other words, the issue is never the issue. It was never women, it was bringing in revolution. It was never LGBT, it's causing revolution. In other words, remember what the Iranians said? They're viewing Hamas as their cannon fodder. Women were cannon, cannon fodder for the revolution. Oh, LGBT comes in. Yep, we'll put them over women. But then we come, uh, Islam comes in. Sorry, LGBTQ, we're going to back Hamas. They'll kill you, but oh well. Do you notice? They're not being honest. The issue is never the really issue. Honestly, they're just trying to turn the world upside down. That's all they're trying to do. They're trying to bring in chaos, to bring an end of the world as you know it, so they can recreate a utopian Marxist socialist state. And Islam is trying to bring in chaos to create a utopian Islamic state. That's why they're putting up with each other. As soon as they won, then they turn on each other because one or the other has to go down next. I don't want to be a part of that kind of a thing that is just so cold and calculating that they just view, the, view their allies as cannon fodder. That's not how Jesus did things. But here's the bottom line. Both the radical left and radical Islam, Jesus is just a good man but not God. The Bible is just a book, but not your authority. There's the real issue. There's the bottom line. And for all these other things, they work together. Now, if you were to go to Voice of the Martyrs, 
and look at their restricted and hostile countries. In other words, the, where Christians are being persecuted, where you could get in serious trouble today for being a Christian. 42 of those countries are Islamist. 11. Oh, yeah, 47. <laughs> 47 of them are Islamist. 11 are Marxist socialist. All others combined can come up with only four. Daniel 11, Revelation 11. Islam is the primary. Marxist socialism is ally. How many ways do you have to see it to see it? And Adventists are still arguing, is it Marxism or is it Marxist socialism or is it uh, Islam is the king of the south? It's both. It's both. Islam is actually the king of the south, but out of the French Revolution comes its ally. Now, we've got this conflict. It's in Europe and Israel. You have this left-right conflict between the king of the north versus king of the south. By the way, if you're looking at a map in Europe, it's really handy in Europe. The political left, everything down the west coast of Europe is radical left. Down the right side of Europe, it's the radical right. Over here on the right side, they've experienced and survived Turkish invasions during the Ottoman Empire. They had survived Marxist socialism during the Soviet Union. They don't want either of them back, thank you. Over here on the left side, Mark, uh, radical left is in control and radical Islam is taking over as well. You have Muslim no-go zones. In other words, the police don't even go in without an armored personnel carrier in the Muslim neighborhoods. That's what it's come to. Um, so you have it in Europe and Israel. Have you noticed a little bit of left-right polarization in the United States? You are living through the most interesting presidential campaign probably in American history. Um, I can't tell you who's going to win, but eventually I do believe somebody from the right is going to win, and it's going to be ugly. And I can just tell you this. If Trump wins, it'll probably be ugly because he right now has to settle some scores in his mind against radical Islam and the radical left. Tell me if that doesn't match prophecy. Cannot persecute the Sabbath without telling the Constitution. Yeah. You've got to get rid of all kinds of things. Oh, the Catholic Church is having a left-right conflict. It's interesting. Uh, uh, the American Catholic Church is losing several bishops right now. The Pope's getting rid of them because they were too far right. Uh, there is about to be a pushback in, as well in the Catholic Church. But get this. No church is immune. We have an issue also in the Adventist church. Left, right. You go to our Adventist institutions and you find that conflict pushing back and forth. It's called the shaking, I believe. Something would shake the whole world and the church. And whatever it is on those issues, you can get in trouble for speaking the straight truth or the testimony. And you know, both the left and the right will get mad at you if you speak the truth. So I think we're in it, folks. I really believe we're in the shaking. It's already well underway. Praise the Lord, that means Jesus could be coming soon. And you're going to be caught in the middle if you follow Jesus in the Bible. Uh, now, what to expect next? Well, it's really clear in the Bible. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. So the king of the south comes in and they're allies. And the king of the north comes back like a whirlwind. In other words, there is going to be one huge pendulum swing. Radicals are overthrown, moderate follow, and some follow Jesus. But you know when the pendulum swings, it's a giant wrecking ball coming through. So if you're standing beside a building that has a wrecking ball coming and then you're in line with it, what's the best suggestion? Duck. <laughs> because are you going to side with the north or the south? The left or the right? 
That is my plea for you right now, that you make your decision right now that you're going to side with Jesus Christ, loving people on all sides. This is not your fight. Let this one swing by you. And then stand right back up, loving people for Jesus. Now you, you, got, you keep your eyes on the left right now because they're the ones attacking you, you duck, and you better turn the other way because they're going to stab you in the back if you don't turn around and start watching them. But now you gotta lo- you've got to love them on both sides. So right now, the radical left and radical Islam, they're, they're close to gaining control, but it might be slipping from their grasp which means they will act in desperation. And when they act in desperation, what will it do to the other side? Make the other side happy or angry? Very, very angry. I mean, it's just all around us. And uh, those alliances again, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, Syria, that's the Ukrainian war. Ukraine, US, NATO, Israel. Israel, war. Hamas on one side, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, Syria, Hezbollah on the other. Israel, United States, and NATO, along with the religious right and the moderate left. Notice how both Ukraine war and the war in Israel have almost the same alliances. The world has chosen sides. Are they on the King of the North Alliance side or are they King of the South Alliance side? Somebody says, well, Tim, you're making this just too simplistic. Well, it says all the world follows the beast and you've got a war between the North and the South. So what do you think it'll be like at the end? It should be coming out pretty simplistic eventually. Which side are you on? And the answer is neither. <sighs> Uh, so, yeah. Now, let's take a look at this. The U.S. Protestantism rises and supports the King of the North, Revelation 13. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and he deceives those who dwell in the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Okay, friends, it's already happening. What I mean by fire and glory. This is written by a guy who claims to be a prophet with millions of followers. You may not know him. I've been tracking him for a while now. And there are several people like him. The angry left does not know they are building a massive backlash. Any guess which side he'd identify with? He's coming from the right. But I just pointed, painted the picture that this is true, didn't I? And it is true. I believe they are setting the stage to bring the greatest number of souls to Christianity in American history. I also believe that's right. It's scary to think that I agree with this guy on so many things. But what he doesn't get is there is a true revival and a counterfeit revival. That is crucial to understand. Remember, the left hates the Bible. The right claims it follows it, but doesn't. Neither is following it. Let's keep going. The fire and glory that will fall in the Hertz arena is not just going to be awesome, but remember, in Revelation 13, fire comes down in the sight of men, working signs, wonders, and miracles to deceive people, right? Keep that in mind. It's like this guy forgot to read that part of the Bible. The fire and glory that will fall in the Hertz arena is not just going to be awesome. I believe it will be the greatest display of supernatural power I have ever witnessed. Why? Because we need it. But there is another massive reason. Monday night, October 24, at 7 p.m., Lance, which is another prophet who has millions of followers, will present an explosive message that rips the mask off what is happening in our nation. He will declare a manifesto of awakening that will shake the very foundations of the corruption and deception in our government and culture. 
Is there any of it in our government? Yeah. What would just tickle me if equal justice was applied on both sides? Boy, would we get a whole new list of leadership. His presentation will end in a Mount Carmel moment. Remember Revelation 13, folks. The fire of God will fall on the audience, an audience that will be transformed into an army to fight against the left. Be there when the fire of God falls and changes us all forever. On the second night, people are bringing the sick from everywhere to be healed. I already know that the Holy Spirit is going to demonstrate greater and deeper miracles than I've ever experienced in my ministry. All right, he's telling everybody what the Holy Spirit's going to do before it does it. And which nights? Because he scheduled it. But then, God scheduled it on Mount Carmel too, didn't he? What would have happened to Elijah if the fire would have fallen on Baal's altar on Mount Carmel? Same thing that happened to the 400 priests. It would be the same thing that happened to the priest of Baal. They were killed. Elijah would have died if the fire would have fallen on the wrong side. Get this. Which side does the fire fall in Revelation 13? The counterfeit gets the fire. And God's people, they go out to take away their ability to buy and sell and to kill them. Are you ready for a reversal of Mount Carmel? This guy is definitely ready. By the way, that did not happen in October. It happened in December. There was a hurricane. So his timing that he called it didn't exactly happen. God said, not really. And so it was delayed until December 5 and 6. And they couldn't use the Hertz Arena because it was being used for a staging area for di disaster relief for the hurricane work. <laughs> so they had to bring in a big tent. But that was a good thing for them, they thought, because now they have this tent that seats 5,000 people, and they're going all over the country in their fire and glory tour. And on the first night, they preach and expose all the evils, and, and, and then they have all kinds of signs, wonders, and miracles to prove it's from God. Revelation says signs, wonders, and miracles to deceive people. Second Thessalonians, signs, wonders, and miracles to deceive people. Are they reading their Bible? I was giving a Bible study back in the 1980s. And it was a couple, Ricky and Gina. They were... Their family kind of wanted them to study, part of their family... I don't think they really did at the time. So they said, okay, Tim, we'll study the Bible with you, but we don't get off work until about midnight. So 1230, we'll study. I figured they'd think I wouldn't show up. I decided to call them on it and showed up. And I kept going night after night at 1230, once a week. Partway through the series, they hand me a studies. They handed me a newspaper. It was a publication from a uh, po Pentecostal group that believes, does not believe the Trinity, only Jesus. Jesus only group. And in it, there was an article about Seventh-day Adventist. It says, Seventh-day Adventists have the law, but we have fire from heaven. I read that little article, and I looked at him and said, so you really want to use this to say that you're going to follow this other group? Yeah. I said, do you mind if we look in Revelation for a moment? Let's see what the fire from heaven is in Revelation, if it's good or bad. And we looked in Revelation 13, and the fire from heaven is what comes from the counterfeit, not from the real at the end, that God allows the rules of Mount Carmel to flip. And if you're not reading God's word, you're going to be deceived by it. Notice what God is doing. The left isn't following his word. That's obvious. The right claims to be following his word, but he's about to allow something to happen that will demonstrate if you're really following it or not. Because the Bible gives you the warning, the fire from heaven is not from God at this point in history. 
It's the counterfeit. And I said, and it says the Adventists have the law. I said, if you look at the chapter before Revelation 13 and the chapter after it, you can figure those out, 12 and 14. You know what it says in both of them? Here are God's people that keep, have the, keep the commandments and have the testimony of Jesus or the faith of Jesus. So your article just says Adventists have the law, but we have the fire. I would suggest in Revelation that comes out really well for us as long as we're linked to Jesus in the process. <laughs> that was the last study I had with that couple. <laughs> Uh, I wasn't welcome after that. <laughs> it's amazing how that goes. You know, God's word can trigger people. I can just tell you. <laughs> Years later, I get a phone call from an Adventist pastor. Hey, it isn't a different state than where I was given those studies or where I was at the moment. I said, hey, this last Sabbath, I had a couple by the name of Ricky and Gina come into my church. They said, quite a few years ago, they were studying the Bible with you. And they want to finish that Bible study series. What studies were you using? <laughs> I said, sorry, they're out of print, but I have one set in my file that's clean and you can make copies of. I sent it to them. I don't know what the end of the story is. But years later, you know that was just working on them and working on them. <laughs> I want you to know something. You are not responsible to win anyone to Jesus Christ. Because you can't do it anyway. All you're responsible to do is share the peace that God gives for you to share. Now, does that make you feel better? The weight's not on you. All you have to do is to share what you have. I pray every day that the Lord's going to give me somebody to talk to to share love or truth with. It's an amazing adventure in how that happens. I'd encourage you to do the same, and you might be thinking, yeah, but I'm not sure I'd have all the answers. I just heard him say good. I agree with that. Here's why. Number one, if God sent them to you, it's so that you can share what you do have. So share what you do have. And if it goes beyond that to what you don't have, God just gave you your assignment of what you're supposed to be learning next. So what's bad about that? It's a win-win. I actually believe that very strongly. When I started presenting Daniel 11, I shuddered to think how little I knew. But God was very kind. He only allowed me to get little challenges at first. And then the challenges progressively got more and more serious. If I'd have been hit by all those serious challenges right at the very beginning, it would have overwhelmed me. But because God was so kind, every one of those made me go deeper into the text, deeper into the text, deeper into the text. Not just me, a group of scholars that really know Hebrew going deep into the text. And the answers were always there in the text and in history. God is awesome. What are we afraid of? The Holy Spirit is supposed to be there to guide us and help us, right? So you are not alone. I told some kids last week in Dakota Adventist Academy, hey, we're just along for the ride to see what God's going to do. Go have an adventure on the ride. And that applies to all of us. Crisis Magazine points out conservatives' leaders keep converting to Catholicism. They give a whole list of them. Ron DeSantis, putting on the armor of God to fight leftism. Trump claims Christianity labels from time to time. He was once asked by a reporter if he'd ever confessed anything to God. He said, no, I've never done anything I need to confess for. Which means he doesn't understand Christianity. Because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Of course, if I was him, I wouldn't want to say, admit to anything either because it would now get used against me. In the process, he doesn't come off honest. Uh, Christian nationalism or gay sharia, there really is no option C. 
The Stream is a conservative Christian website. Figure that title out for a moment. Christian nationalism, when you make Christianity the national religion, wouldn't it be nice to be in a Christian nation? (laughs) No. Why not? If it's truly Christian, it wouldn't be bad. But only five out of 100 Christians in North America are born again with a biblical worldview. Which means 95% of Christians aren't really aren't Christian. Which would win the election on deciding what the national religion would look like? 5% or 95%? Every time there's been a Christian nation, true Christians were persecuted. You don't want to go there. Or gay Sharia? Well, again, Sharia is Muslim law, and what does Muslim law do to homosexuals? Kills them. That doesn't work out well either. There is no option C. Really? Yeah, there is. It's called the center. C for center, when you're caught between the two. The middle, where Jesus was, loving all sides. In other words, learn critical thinking. Don't go for their false dichotomies. It's not one or the other. Although they were pointing out something really interesting. Monkeypox, super super spreader, gay orgies are essential, but church gatherings aren't. I don't know if you know what this was. In August of 2021, there's every year in August, there's an event in New Orleans. And unfortunately, I've got to fly in the New Orleans on a regular basis. That's where I was coming from on Thursday. Uh, Karen's mother lives on the south side of Baton Rouge, just north of New Orleans. So we've got to go in there a lot. But they have this event called Southern Decadence, where two the four two the four hundred thousand homosexuals gather for a big party, mostly orgy. It is not a good place to be, and at that moment, monkeypox was spreading. And the CDC couldn't find their voice to say, this is not a good idea, we should shut this down. But they could say, churches aren't essential and shut them down the year before. When they allowed strip clubs and liquor stores to stay open. Does this not start sound like The king of the south is pushing against the king of the north in many, many ways. And the anger is building and building. And by the way, the king of the south has been effective. I travel around churches, mostly Seventh-day Adventist churches, but I'm sure it holds to other churches as well. The longer a church shut down for COVID, the lower its attendance is today in relationship to its membership. By and large, that holds true. The shorter it was shut down, the less damage occurred from the shutdown during COVID. Uh, King of the South is attacking. Social conservatism in the U.S. highest in about a decade. You may not realize that, but the pendulum is swinging. And uh, the latest Last time this many Americans said they were socially conservative was 2012. The survey comes at a time when many states are considering policies regarding transgender matters, abortion, crime, drug use, and the teaching of gender and sexuality in schools. The increase in conservative identification on social issues over the past two years is seen among nearly all political and demographic subgroups. In other words, it's wide-ranging in the pushback. In the young people, what is interesting, it's mostly young men that are going conservative and young women aren't so much. Uh, But get this, in that same research, it points out that seven in 10 people in North America believe there are only two genders. Isn't that interesting? All this heat comes out of 3% or 30% of the population. What's going to happen when the other big percentage gets tired of it? You're going to have a pushback. And it's beginning. 
So which is most dangerous? The north, the south, the left, or the right? And I could get in trouble for answering that, but here goes. If you're looking at the north, papal-led Christianity or Islam, well, if you're raised in the Muslim world, you're more likely to be pulled towards the Muslims. If you're raised in the Christian world, you're more likely to be pushed towards the king of the north. So it's the side where you grew up and you're comfortable with it's most dangerous for you. What about the left or the right? <laughs> the side you lean towards is the most dangerous. Because the other side will not deceive you, it's your side that will get you. All right? You know the evils of the other side, but you're nose blind to the stench of your own viewpoints. It's just the way it is. So you need to identify which side you lean towards to be on guard of your side. That's the side that will take you down. That's the side that would get you to leave Jesus for a political or social viewpoint. You're fighting the other side. They won't take you down. It's your side that will bite you and take you down. There is a caveat to that. The side in power is the most dangerous for everybody. And right now, the left has a lot of power. But I'm seeing that beginning to change and crack. And I'm watching the anger build on the right. And which means when you get a bunch of angry people in charge, what are they going to be in charge like? Not going to end so well, is it? Now, I could just figure all this out from common sense if I wanted to, but it was all in the Bible 2,000 plus years ago. So we should be paying attention to what's there because the Bible has never missed. And our Bible verse this morning when it happens, you'll believe. What do you need to believe? Yeah, we're right at the end. The next thing up is the greatest opportunity to share the gospel ever. So get busy now because it's already begun. Start sharing it so you're in practice when it really gets fun. And it is fun sharing the Bible truths with people. It can get a little dicey when you touch base with somebody who doesn't like it, but as I've said before, get over that. And uh, then we have a time of trouble like there never was, which is a very short time, and Jesus comes. By the way, that time of trouble is overlapping the greatest evangelistic opportunity of all time. You don't think you're going to get a free pass to share the gospel without a price to pay, do you? <laughs> But I will just tell you, it's fabulous when you get the chance. Get this. There was an evangelistic explosion right here at the fall of the French Revolution. There was a two-year window right here of evangelism uh, in Eastern Europe, in Russia. When the Ottoman Empire fell, there was an evangelistic opening in there. The Millerite movement was a part of it, the revivals. What do you think is going to happen with radical Islam and the radical left go down together? It will be the greatest evangelistic opportunity of all time. And that always keeps me happy. Do I have time for a short story? A story that happened right here. I was teaching a Sabbath school class in Hagerstown, Maryland. Okay, and uh, I thought that's a 25 mile an hour speed limit out there. <laughs> okay. They're very much out in force right now, giving Christmas presents. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, 1991, just as communism was falling, we're in that evangelistic opportunity. I was in Hagerstown, Maryland. I was aware of what was going on in the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union. I didn't know it was going to walk into my church and that I was going to be threatened within days because of it. But I'm teaching Sabbath school, and a young man walks into my Sabbath school class, and he's wearing a lapel pin that says uh, International Leadership Conference, and then it's 
sponsored by the Unification Church. I'm beating my brain. Unification Church, Unification Church, what is that? And it wasn't coming right up. But I'm talking to them, and there's 200, just over 200 young people, Russians, between the ages of 17 and 25, that have been brought to the United States by the Unification Church for leadership training. International leadership training. Okay. In Hagerstown, Maryland, in the convention center, which is just down the street from our church. Convention center's up on a hill. We're in a valley. Up on the hill on the other side is a McDonald's in a shopping plaza. These Russian young people, every time they could get away for a break, they were headed down and going over to the McDonald's because in 1990s, it was a big deal in Russia to say you've eaten in a McDonald's. Mm, okay, whatever it is, it is. <laughs> and uh, they were coming by our church, evidently. I had not noticed that yet. And uh, this man talks to me for a little bit. His name is Vadim Gapa. And Vadim talks to me a little bit, and... He's interested in the Adventist church. He attended an Adventist series of meetings in Russia as communism was just falling a few months before. Okay? He takes off. He's got to go. And I'm sitting there in the afternoon thinking about this after I preached. I know. Unification Church led by Reverend Moon, the Moonies. Now I'm thinking, oh, no. That means they've got a whole bunch of Russians between 17 and 25. By the way, they all had to know English to come on this trip. That I can go talk to. I can run interference against the Moonies. Okay. And I called the review on Monday morning early. Oh, Sabbath afternoon. I got this big, peace-loving black guy member of my church, he says, I'm going to go up there and find out what's going on because we were talking to a couple of them as they were walking by. And he goes up there and he comes back a few, a few minutes later and he says, Tim, if you go up there, watch out for their bouncers. Bouncers? Yeah, they've got big guys with radios on their belts. I mean, they're big guys and they will escort you out. They just escorted me out. Okay, so I watch for bouncers if I go up there. Got it. And I knew I'd be going up there. <laughs> and... Uh, so, Monday morning early, because they went up to Gettysburg for Sunday, which was just north of Hagerstown, or just near Hagerstown. And uh, so, we, Monday morning, I called in the review and said, do you guys, printing press that was in Hagerstown, I know you just printed a whole bunch of Steps to Christ in Russian. You're sending off to Russia. Do you have any of those still? Oh, we just sent that container out last week. Can you look to see if any got left? Okay, and they called me back a few minutes later. Oh, there was actually two boxes of a 100 each that didn't fit in the container. I have how many Russians? 200. Thank you, Lord. I'm on my over the, way over to get them. <laughs> I walked out of there with my 200 steps to Christ in Russian, and I headed for the convention center. I sat down in the lobby, and I watched. And sure enough, out of one hall of rooms comes the bouncer with the radio and another one. And I figured out their pattern. If you're security, don't have a set pattern. But anyway, and I, I talked to a maid. Which part of the hotel are the Russians in? This is my hometown. I've done events in this place. I know the place. And, and they tell me which group of rooms. Thank you. And I watch down that hallway, and here comes a bouncer out, and I know I've got about two or three minutes that I can do something in the hallway, then I've got to get out. I head in the hallway. I drop two steps to Christ, kick him under a door. <laughs> Going down the hall doing that, get out of the hall. Here comes a bouncer. He comes through. I go do the other side of the hall. I'm working through my block of rooms. After a little bit, I thought, you know, I could probably get in trouble for doing this. But at what point are you ready to get in trouble for Jesus? But I decided I wanted to have a better idea what was going on. So I went down another hallway. That there's a convention center. And down below on the ground floor, but in an upstairs hallway, there's a room off the convention center that's actually a press box. And sure enough, the door wasn't locked. I opened the door, closed it again, slipped into the room, 
and I'm sitting behind a half wall. Down over the wall is a, they, they've got them in group, small groups, 10 to 15 people in small groups all over this convention center floor in circles. And there's a group right below me. And I'm sitting here, and I can listen to what they're being told just on the outside the wall and a floor down. This is what they're being told. Jesus failed in his ministry as the Messiah. His death on the cross proved that he's a failure. I listened to this. And thus there would have to be a new Messiah born in the peace-loving nation of Korea, and he would be born in the 1930s. Okay, moon, 1930s, Korea, okay. And uh, so Jesus is a failure? Now you've really got me irritated, Moonies. These Russian young people were looking for spiritual answers after the fall of atheistic communism, and they're getting this. Ooh. I came out of that room, and I headed into the, up to the front desk, and I said, can I rent one of your breakout rooms? Just a meeting room. That'd be $85. Pulled out my wallet, my credit card. I'll take it. Hotel manager's walking by at that moment and says, what are you going to use that room for? I'm thinking, none of your business if I'm renting a room. But she wanted to know. I said, I'm going to have a display of books. What kind of books? Religious books. You cannot have the room. We have a non-competition clause with a group in this hotel. I've now blown my cover. The assistant manager who's helping me looks at me, manager standing behind her, and she mouths to me where the manager can't say, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Because all of a sudden she's just realized what's going on. So I turn to walk away. I've got books still in my shoulder bag, which I'm not telling them about what I've got in my shoulder bag because they're going to find out soon enough. <laughs> I'm walking out and four men are walking in, a survey crew. They're going to be spending the night in the hotel. I said, hey, guys, you spend the night here? Yeah. I said, are you Christians? Guy looked at me and said, I'm Catholic. I said, good enough for me. I said, you love Jesus, don't you? And he's just going like this. I said, look, there's a 200 Russian young people in here that are just being told that Jesus failed in his ministry of the Messiah. And I've got books called Steps to Christ in Russian to tell them that Jesus is the Messiah. Would you take some and give them the Russian young people you meet tonight in the hotel, around the hotel? No, 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 no. So much for being Christian. Uh, went back to my church. I was going back to my church, and just outside I met a group of 10 to 15 Russian young people taking a smoking break. They'd escaped the smoke. And I joined the group, and I started handing them Steps to Christ in Russian. And by the way, praise the Lord for smokers in this case. And uh, one of the Russians looked at me and said, is there any, I mean, is, does, do you have religious liberty in this country? I said, yes, we do. He said, why aren't people de out here demonstrating against what's happening to us? I said, what's happening? He said, they took the TVs out of our room. They took the radios out of our room. They took the telephones out of our room. We eat when they say eat. We sleep when we're allowed to sleep. And we have to be in meetings and go where they say to go. Moonies were known for brainwashing. I said, you do have religious freedom in this country, and even if they get mad at you, they can't make you do anything. I'm thinking they could, you could lose your ticket back to Russia. But maybe that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. <laughs> but I didn't say that. And uh, I said, so here's what I want you to do. I said, go tell all your friends about these steps to Christ in Russian. And you know that church in the valley between here and McDonald's? They said, yeah. Just tell all your friends that church will be open as late as it needs to be as long as people keep coming. And I'm going to give away free Bibles and ask all your, answer all your Bible questions. You just go tell all your friends to go down there. I'll be waiting. And I left. Got to the church and I made a phone call. There's a Sunday-keeping church that rented our church on Sunday. It was a Presbyterian church, a conservative one. And I was talking to the pastor. His name was John. I said, John, you want to come down to the church and meet me? I said, I'm about to have an adventure and I might need help. He said, no, I'm too busy. 
So he wouldn't come help. I called a retired guy in my church. I said, I need somebody to man a literature rack. He said, where? I said, on the shoulder of the four-lane highway out front. What? I said, yeah, we had a bunch of Russian young people walking back and forth on the shoulder of this four-lane highway, and I want you out there with a literature rack to invite them inside. He said, on my way over. He ended up being published on the articles he wrote based on what happened to him that day. Uh, but I'm inside. I did get some cases of Bibles, and I set them out, waiting, and in just a little bit, Russian young people started pouring in. And they'd ask me questions. It's about Jesus and the state of the dead were the major questions. Salvation, state of the dead. And I would just dog ear the pages of the Bible, hand it to them, and go read it in context. Next Bible. You know, we had leftover Bibles from an old evangelistic series. Praise the Lord, we're getting these things out in hands. People that'll read it. And it wasn't very long, and into my church comes the bouncers. Now we're in a different situation. And one of these bouncers walked up to me and he says, do you know who you're messing with? I said, yeah, I do. He said, you better be careful. You could lose your church. I said, see the for sale sign out front? Make my day. We were trying to sell it to build a new church, but nobody was buying. They wanted to destroy my church. Go for it. <laughs> I figured that's the best way to deal with a threat. Just laugh at them and go ahead. See if I care. He grabs a young Russian that I'm giving a Bible study to. And says, it's time to go. But you have to understand, the Russian's just as big as he is. And the Russian pops the bouncer off to the side and turns and asks me another question. Gets grabbed hold of, it's time to go. Pops him off and keeps asking questions. Do you know how exciting it is to give a Bible study to somebody who's literally fighting to hear the answers? And as he walks away, the bouncer reaches over and says, give me your materials. He sticks him down inside of his clothing and looks at the bouncer with the look of, you try and get it. I stepped out, well, I called my dad because I was being overwhelmed with numbers inside my church. Plus, I thought I might need a witness to something that could happen. Dad was visiting. I said, Dad, could you get down to the church right away? I said, I need help. I need somebody to help, give me, help me give Bible studies. He says, I don't know how to give Bible studies. He says, Dad, you know a lot more than these people do. Get down here. I got another, tossed a book of Bibles off to the other side of the church, box of Bibles, and my dad stands over there, and he starts giving Bible studies. <laughs> I've got a group, of, and I just... Oh, I love seeing my dad <laughs> surrounded with people giving Bible studies. I stepped outside in a break, and there's a video camera videoing people coming and going out of our church. I waved at him. Again, what do you do to intimidation? You don't fall for it. I can tell you I've never had more fun while being threatened in my life. A couple months later, our church was totally gutted with fire. Praise the Lord, we got a new church. And it unified our church, although they didn't do it. It wasn't arsonists, but it wasn't them. <laughs> uh, we gave them so much trouble, they had to leave Hagerstown. Actually, I should tell you one other piece. I thought... I've been having so much fun, I need to let the newspaper know what's going on in town. So I called, and a guy by the name of Clyde Ford came over and uh, interviewed me. He said, now I'm going to go up to the convention center. I said, just watch out for the bouncers. He said, this is America. And I said, I warned you. <laughs> he goes up there. He got bounced. How do I know that? Headline news the next day. You get the reporters mad at you in town. It's not going to go well. <laughs> they told everything we'd been doing in a positive sense and what they were doing in a negative sense, man. Oh, that was a good story. And uh, they had to pull out and go down to Washington, D.C. And they lied about where they were going. 
because we, Vadim Gapa came running over, we're leaving and we're going to a Holiday Inn down by Washington, D.C. It was not the place. We called the hotel. They're not here. Why do you want to know? We told him. Ah, oh, he was a Christian. He's in on this. He says, I'm connected to the hospitality industry in D.C. If they're here, I'll let you know. He calls back. Here's where they are. And we sent students from uh, Washington Adventist University over there. And there was a hotel attached to a Galleria mall. And we flooded the mall with Christian students looking for Russian young people and kept the press going. It was so much fun. Vadim Gapa became a translator for evangelistic series in Russia. That's what we've got coming, folks. Just because you get threatened doesn't mean it's not a good thing. It could be the best thing ever. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions you want to ask? And we'll wrap it. Yes, sir. Let's say we get another pandemic or epidemic, whatever there is the allegation, and the government tells our churches to not have services and shut down. Should we do what the government said? Depends. If there's a real scientific reason, probably should consider it. If it's a political ploy, we should reject it. What if they disguise the uh, put politics and make it sound scientific? Then you better check the science. You see, the whole world had practice on COVID. Practice how to lie and how to control and how to study. Um, but you've had practice on how to respond as well. Don't have a knee-jerk reaction one way or the other. I will tell you, I will be more reluctant to close down the next round. I'm not saying I won't, but I am saying I will be more reluctant to do it because uh, there were a lot of things we weren't told the truth on. So in, in light of what you have shared, we have an interesting addition playing out to this where what we're noticing is within our own government, within our own institution, within the far right side of our political members of our Congress, we're watching the emergence of a pro-Putin group, uh, anti-Ukraine, uh, isn't it interesting, though, to see how even within the right-left story, we're watching even a percentage of those that you would think would normally be anti are now becoming pro. And, and they're aligning themselves <laughs> as we're sitting here having this conversation. We're watching alignments take place in ways we never thought it could happen, but it is fascinating. Right. We're just watching it unfold right in front of us. And the far left and the far right both agree they, they've both become anti-Semitic. Yeah, isn't that just fascinating? So, so and, and by the way, with Jesus, <laughs> the Pharisees and Sadducees united to take him down. That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> so I just, I especially feel that right now in our world, this material is very, very important. Coming in, in the United States, in the next 11 months, politics are going to be insane. And if you understand Daniel 11, it will give you a stability to keep you from getting your emotions whipsawed by this stuff because you can start looking at both of them and realize, yeah, this, is, this is just all a package of evil on the sides. And it's not like World War II. It's not like, it is not in many mm -mm. ways very unlike the situation with Europe and Germany. During the Crusades, this is what Daniel says of the king of the north and the king of the south. They sat down at the same table and lied to each other. Yes. We're in that today. Does that not describe today's world? Perfect. When the north and the south are talking at each other, they're lying about each other. 
and themselves. And it's just, just keep that in mind. And I would encourage you, I mean, you've got this link. Tell people that you know to watch this or other presentations because this needs to be out there as wide as we can. In the Adventist church, we need to stop fighting as the king of the South, Islam or atheism. Why not both? This alliance that's obviously forming in the world around us. Get this. You know what the scholars tell me when I lay out, here's what the Bible says and here's what's happening? They tell me I'm not allowed to use current events. I'm sorry. You can't do that, Tim. And I ask why. Because you just have to base it totally on scripture. You can't use current events. I said, so when a Sunday law hits, we can't say something's happening? No, of course not. <laughs> I said, if what you were saying was happening, you'd be all over it. The reason you're not saying anything is because what you're saying was going to happen hasn't. But what we've been talking about, just step by step, keeps going on. And it's not because I'm smart or I'm a prophet. I just decided to take Daniel 11 for what it said and quit trying to make it symbolic. And I'm not alone. I, Roy Gain and others, and a great theologians, scholars, work with me on this stuff. And they're a little more reluctant to use current events than I do. They are watching them carefully because they live in a scholarly environment that will just be attacked mercilessly for what they say. They already are. But you hear doctors, scientists, and theologians all talk about their peer-reviewed articles. Do you know what peer-reviewed means? Group think. And boy, have I learned that because I deal with it all the time. And uh, don't fall for groupthink. One more, one more last few questions. Yeah. Well, some I hear quite frequently that when we describe the world conditions, people will say, yeah, but it's always been this. Stephen, I think I heard him say something like that once. Uh, the leaders are always corrupt. Haven't you studied Roman history and everything? So, So, women's rights were pushed by the left. That was a good thing. Within reason. You mean no women's ordination? No, I, I'm just saying equal pay, uh, equal work, lots of things, good, right? Uh, racism. Those have been political issues from both sides. Some for good, some for bad. I'm just, I guess what I'm saying is I can actually pick out quite a few things that are good from both sides. I was pastoring that large church of 900 and some members that was very divided. I, about two years after I'd left there, I got a call from one of the leaders of one of the factions. <laughs> Now that you've been gone two years, would you tell me which side you were on? <laughs> I said, can you not figure it out yet? There's good and bad on all sides. And uh, this is why we've got to love people from all sides. As soon as you decide one side is the good side and the other is the bad side, you stop seeing the good and you see everything from the other side is evil which means you've now fallen into the deception of your side somewhere. And so you've got to figure out which side you lean towards. By the way, I can give you a test. It's not quite as accurate as it used to be. All you have to do is watch CNN for an hour and then Fox News for an hour 
and then ask yourself, which one makes you more angry? <laughs> more angry. If CNN makes you more angry, you lean right. If Fox News makes you more angry, you lean left. Now you know which side to be aware of, your side. <laughs> and you will want to listen to the ones that agree with you, which is a danger as well, because you're only getting half the story. Yeah, if that. <laughs> What's intriguing to me over the past 18 months is that I have learned today that preaching the gospel, that God loves every human being. Amen. Is woke theology. You've learned that's woke theology? I have learned that's, not only have I learned that's woke theology, but I've had individuals leave the church because you're supposed to love everybody? That's right. Well, then they don't belong in Jesus' group. Interesting, isn't it? And it's not a liberal conservative issue. No, you, you can lose people on either side that way. That's right. No. Ever heard that Jesus could have come before this? Yes. No. Watch this. You have an introduction to the time of the end from 1798 to 1843-44. During this time period, the papacy starts to resurge. The United States comes into play. Uh, Islam hits its bottom and begins to come up. And the French Revolution comes up. All the king of the north, king of the south players and allies are in position by the time you hit 1844. Everything is there. The only reason we haven't left is God keeps calling timeouts because his people aren't ready. The players have always been there. It said the second woe is over. The third woe is beginning. At that moment, right in 1840, coming into this time period, the players were now all in position. Isn't that interesting? We're on borrowed time. Question. One of the things I really desire is when I have conversations with people, and especially with fellow Christians, to try to bring them into a conversation about Jesus, about ministry, about love. It's easy for me to do that with people that aren't Christians. The Christian no matter what faith they're from, seem bent on going to politics. How? <laughs> is there anything else that interests you? How do you, in a general conversation, you have been successful in keep, keeping it on ministering and loving to people rather than divisions over politics? The best thing I've been able to do is point out how the left and the right, north and south, are both bad. Um, I, uh, I've had people tell me they just got hit between the eyes by a two-by-four. This guy was a major Trump supporter. And he says, I've just decided that I need to commit more to Jesus and less to politics. You should have seen his wife standing behind him going. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had somebody get up and walk out of a church, a big church in Arizona. I didn't know it, but they walked out. Big church, you don't notice everybody that walks out. Smaller ones, you do. <laughs> and two weeks later, I was in a church down in Alabama. And the head elder, I mean, I, I, the pastors told me about what happened in Arizona. Um, I'd been talking about the radical left, and I mentioned, you know, the idea of Black Lives Matter for slave traders. Do you know when Muslim countries were still coming around to outlawing slavery? Are they still doing it? 1980s, officially they made it illegal. But in Islamist countries, they're still doing it. Yes. Yeah, it's done under the table. Well, it was done right out in the open when the Islamic State was in control. 
but I just said it makes no sense, you know. And there was somebody involved in Black Lives Matter that left. And I am now down in Montgomery, Alabama, had elders a black man, and he walks up to me and he says, I understand two weeks ago somebody got up and left during your presentation over Black Lives Matter. I think, oh, this is going to get interesting. I said, yeah, I was told that. And we talked for a bit, and he said, oh, by the way, you're right. Maybe he was going to be a slave. <laughs> uh, I was glad. But, you know, this is a black man that realized if you w really take a look at some of these issues, again, lack of critical thinking, black lives matter is opposed to the family structure. That's just damaging the black community. They're they run riots in black communities. It takes a decade or two to come back from a riot in a black community. I could go down the list of the different ways Black Lives Matter are actually hurting the black community. They're just all the real reasons. But I didn't go through all that then. And I did with this other guy. And he said, yeah, that's all right. And, but we get sucked into what sounds right on our side. And we become a part of the group think on our side. And anybody who doesn't automatically agree with my side is evil. And you don't understand that we're being lied to from both sides. During COVID, I had one son go into an alt-right group online. And I had another son go into Black Lives Matter. We did not want to get our sons together at this point. Uh, they're both reactive attachment disorder kids, grew up through real abuse, and we adopted them. So it's, it's tricky. But, you know, my older son has now realized he's being lied to from both sides. Yes! <laughs> we, we've really made progress here. As long as we don't get sucked in by our side, we're not likely going to get sucked in by the other side. Pastor Tim, one of the most unique addictive behaviors is the addiction to being right. Yes. And, and under that influence of that in your brain chemistry, that if you threaten that chemistry, you get a, an explosive reaction to don't you love the saying, we do most of our sinning when we're right? At least we think so. <laughs> we do most of our sinning when we're right. <laughs> yeah, and then we're going to wrap it up. Yes, to each of those things you said. Okay. <laughs> and we're going to do most of our sinning when we're right. Both sides will have aspects that they're right about, but they'll not be Christ-like in it. What is a holy war? When both sides act like the devil in the name of God. Let's close with prayer, all right? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, thank you for your spirit that you promised to lead and guide us in all things. We are grateful for that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. By the way, our ministry is a faith ministry, which simply means as long as we get enough funds to operate it, we can. I am the evangelist of the Idaho Conference as long as I raise enough money to pay me my benefits and all other expenses. And uh, we've been doing it for 12 years now. And if you'd like to make a donation, you can do so, either donation to us or go online and make a donation as well. There's an envelope in there. Yeah, there's that envelope, envelope you can use. No, that's Sabbath. I don't sell stuff on Sabbath. My website has them. My website has them. <laughs>